Hey everybody, welcome back to this series where I go through various RPGs and RPG products that I have and give them a quick flip through and review. Um, in this video I'm going to be doing two Mega Dungeons by Greg Gillespie. Barrel Maze, Complete, and the Forbidden Caverns of Archaea. Now both of these are available in 5th edition versions, which is the, one, the ones that I have, and also in Osric or Old School um, rule sets. And I would recommend the latter. I would recommend not getting them for 5e. I'll talk more about why in a bit. Um, but right off the start, I would say both of these books are amazing. Greg has done a great job in both of these uh, Mega Dungeons, um, and I'd recommend getting them both. But again, not in 5e. Get them in, in the old school game. So essentially, you know, as you guys know, I'm sure, Mega Dungeons are dungeons with hundreds of rooms. They're the sorts of things that campaigns are made out of. They're not short adventures you're going to be running. And yet both of these books are really great because of their modularity. I like taking stuff from dungeons and from adventures and publishing and making my own stuff out of it. And this is, both of these books provide a lot of material for your own sort of, uh, your own creations. So I would recommend getting both of these books, even if you don't plan on running a mega dungeon, because first of all, the art is great, the ideas are really good, uh, the world is interesting, it's pretty generic in a lot of ways, but it's, it's fun generic. Um, a little bit like the worlds of um, Jacob Fleming in, uh, you know, in the Shadow Tower Silver Axe and uh, Valley of the Manticore and stuff that I've talked about before. This is a little bit like that in that it's a kind of generic fantasy setting, but the dungeons, the dungeons themselves are really good. The ideas in, the, uh, in them are really good. Great old school ideas. And again, plug and play is really easy to do, especially I would say the Barrel Maze. So I'll talk about that one first and I'll go through each of them. We'll come back to the Forbidden Caverns later. So, as I said, Barrel Maze is, um, this is the uh, special 10th, 10th anniversary edition cover. Um, so you've got, again, great art throughout the book. There's the Barrow Fields that you're going to be entering into. Here on the back are, there's an indication of what's probably going to happen to most of your characters. Eaten by ghouls. And then um, we get into it. Now there's an extended forward which is you know interesting and all that stuff, uh, all the acknowledgments, the preface. Now the presentation of this book is very good. Art, excellent, old school art throughout. Um, very good. Definitely brings to mind, you know, uh, RPGs of the, the 80s. There is a regional hex crawl, the Duchy of Eric that you're given. Uh, along with, of course, uh, the, the maze itself, your starting town, and a few other locations nearby that are mostly hinted at rather than fleshed out, but there's enough here for a full dungeon. For example, um, one, of the, uh, uh, one of the locations here, number five, is the Secret Shrine of Zorgon. And you're not given, like, really almost any information about it except this tiny little paragraph here. It's a dungeon site. It's a mysterious dungeon site, but that's all he mentions. There's no other connection to it. Just that there's nearby is something called the Sh Secret Shrine of Zorgon. So obviously you're going to create uh, a dungeon there. And the players can then have a, have a break from the sort of dungeon crawling they're going to be doing in Barrow Maze, which is very much going through crypts and killing undead. And you could throw in a different kind of dungeon uh, to vary it up. If you know if you're going to be doing this as sort of a regional hex crawl or something like that. Or if you're going to be doing this as more of a West Marches, where here is the region and here are some different locations and there's one big mega dungeon that most parties are going to go to over and over but then there are a couple other locations they can discover and, and kind of have smaller adventures there that would be a great thing to do is to fill out those locations so you're given a um a gazetteer gazetteer i forget how you say it gazetteer is how i've always said it um you have a gazetteer of the region including the geography the different faiths and religions that are in the area um, obviously the, the, the named locations on the map, the towns, and some details about them, including the different NPCs. Now, the main town is called Helix. It's the main place where you're going to be going back to, and it's where you're going to have your standard, um, your, your hometown, and it's got a little bit of interesting things there. There's a few potential quests. There's a few potential um, mysteries happening back in Helix, a couple connections to the dungeon itself. But for the most part, it's just a hub, and you have NPCs. And I like I like the fact that every NPC, or all the major ones at least, are given a little portrait up here, so you can at least maybe you don't show this to your players, maybe you do, but it, at the very least, you can describe them based on what you, what you see. Um, 
the town is given a, a lot of details here. And, and it's, it's very clear that there will be adventures happening here, but it's going to be up to you, the DM, to make them fleshed out. That as written, it's pretty simple, pretty basic. You don't have to flesh it out, obviously. But if you want to make the town more of, a, of an engaging place, you're going to really have to, to do a little bit of work. That's okay. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm a fan of that style rather than here's everything filled out for you with all of the characters and every detail about them. I think it's better to go on the minimal side of things, especially for this book, which is quite long. Let me really quickly see. This book is 250 pages or so. Yeah, 250, exactly 250 pages, although a lot of that is credits and, and license stuff at the very end. So you're looking at probably 230 pages of content. Uh, I don't really need extra details about the, the peasants. <laughs> I can fill that out if I need to. Um, there are um, rumors and starting quest hooks that you might have uh, up here, just a few. And then there is running Barrow Maze and how, Barrow, how you're going to want to do it. And there are there's advice here for how to run a, a mega dungeon, how to, how to run this particular mega dungeon, and how to deal with certain systems like burial alcoves. Burial alcoves are found throughout the entirety of the thing, and there are rules about how long it takes you to search them, and in what order you find the things that are found that are hidden there. Um, and time pressure is definitely one of the elements, obviously, in a mega dungeon. And it's one of the reasons why I don't think 5th edition works terribly well for this. Because fifth, time pressure, the exploration elements of D&D, which is what time pressure falls into, light, resource management, food, all of that, that stuff is basically done away with in 5th edition. The light cantrip makes light useless. The good berry spell makes food useless. Um, once you get... Um, uh, the Mordenkainen's, you know, Magnificent Mansion, or even just the Sphere of Protection, or whatever that little pocket dimension is at level 3 or whatever it is. Maybe it's level 5. But that makes resting incredibly easy. So, 5th edition has all of these ways of completely bypassing the exploration elements, and a mega dungeon, where your goal is to get treasure and loot, and get out of there uh, as quickly as you can, that risk reward system is completely unbalanced. So don't I just there's almost no reason to get this book in fifth edition, except for some of the ideas and the monster manual in the back. Really, I mean, it's fun to have on your shelf, but I would never run this for five edition, fifth edition. I've tried. I tried to run this one, and I tried to run High Fell for fifth edition, and um, well, this one I guess I ran Five Torches Deep, which is which is better. It's better than fifth than 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 fifth edition in terms of exploration. Um, and actually, that one worked out pretty well. I didn't. I just ignored a lot of the 5e stuff. But I tried to run High Fell, which is another one of Greg's Meg Mega Dungeons in a similar vein, similar rules, similar ideas in 5th edition, and it just didn't work. It was it was disappointing for everyone involved. Um, the death traps were considered unfair by the 5e players because they put a lot of effort into their characters, and then suddenly they're dead. And the exploration elements that I put in were completely bypassed, total, and, and that are in the book were completely bypassed. The idea that torches were meaningful, that food was meaningful, that light and time sensitivity were meaningful, uh, all totally pointless uh, with short rest mechanics and long rest mechanics made so easy. So no, um, definitely don't recommend for, for 5e. But I do recommend the books in their old school form. I do have the PDFs in old school form and they're, they're much better. Now the basic structure is exactly the same. It's just the stat blocks and uh, the magic items and the damage of the spells and the traps and things like that, which is modified for fight. There are other elements of this dungeon that um, are modified a bit, so turning undead is harder while you're in the mega dungeon, while you're in Barrow Maze, because there's tons of undead here, and so clerics would be a bit overpowered. Death masks, canopic, canopic jars, which you get, these little Neshalk scarab badges things. Uh, gemstone scarabs. And then there are factions within this, although the factions are pretty limited. There's a, a handful of cultists and different kinds of cults that are fighting, and then there are some mongrel folk that are not happy about things that are happening. But for the most part, faction play isn't going to be the big uh, draw of this adventure. Um, there are some rival adventuring parties in the back that I think you could make into factions, basically. Uh, repeating, recurring, not necessarily villains, but sort of villains, and uh, I think that would be more fun than simply having you start to deal with the factions in the dungeon. Although there's some of that. Now, the, the Barrow field itself is kind of how you approach the dungeon. And rather than being a horizontal dungeon, I'm sorry, rather than being a vertical dungeon, it's a horizontal dungeon, right? So um, you start off on the uh, western side of this maze, although I guess you technically could approach it from any direction. I'm not sure why. It assumes you're coming from this direction, even though um, 
the town is over this way. It seems like you would come at it from this direction. But uh, anyway, the, oh, this is all swamp, so maybe that's it. Maybe you have to approach from that side or from the south or something like that. But um, it's sort of a hex crawl. Not really a hex crawl. It's more of like, I, the way I've run it in the past is more of like a point crawl where you're here, you can go to these places, or I'll give them the map of the whole thing with maybe a couple of the hidden ones removed. Um, yeah, like I made it on like Hexographer, just re recreated this and left off the things I didn't want them to see. And then I was like, all right, well then you can now go to the ones that you want to go to. And uh, they would, you know, and I would talk about how, how long it would take you to get from one to the next. And if it was a certain amount of time, I would roll for a random encounter. So they would, they would have, you know, it's more of a point crawl. I think that's the way to do it. But you have access to this entire barrow field and there's a lot of barrows, 70 barrows, I think. Plus, uh, at the back, there are rules for making up more barrows if you want. So there's at least 70 different barrows that you can explore, and a handful of them have entrances into the mega dungeon below. But mostly they are self-contained little dungeons, and this is what I mean by modularity. So the dungeon itself is modular. Yeah, you could take out this portion of it, this room, obviously, because there's not like this overarching story that's very crucial throughout the dungeon. It's a mega dungeon. It's a, you know, there's, sto there's environmental storytelling, and there are some events, but they're more limited uh, and a bit static. That's not really why you're taking this dungeon, is to, to do the great story that's happening here. Um, rather, um, it's, a, it's a place where stories will occur. And the stories that will occur will be the ones that occur at the table. But it's modular in that there are tons of these barrows, which are little dungeons. Maybe three-room dungeons, maybe some are more complex five-room dungeons. There are some that are much bigger, where they're like connected to other barrows through you know, collapses or, or tunnels that have been dug. Um, and you just have these little standalone singular dungeons. Sometimes they have puzzles, sometimes they have uh, simple combat encounters, sometimes they just have treasure. And the players have to try to find their way through them. Again, the art throughout this book is one of the major draws. Super evocative art of what's being described very often on the page. So you have a visual of that particular barrow, if it's a special kind of barrow, or of the special NPC, like this guy. Um, so there's some role playing happening here. There's some, uh, you know, this is this is one of the bigger ones that's connected by, by tunnels. Not every barrow is given a map because sometimes they're sim single room barrows. Sometimes they're not even really rooms; they're just collapsed, and you can just kind of dig through the remains and find treasure and stuff. Um, this is a cool one: a chariot and a team in the in the tomb. But you, uh, but you can obviously take these and you could create your own smaller barrow fields in your own campaign worlds if you have like, you know, the Hill of Kings or something where all the dead kings are buried. You could put a bunch of these barrows in there uh, and surround them. I mean, this is one of the best pieces of art in the book, in, in my opinion. I love this one. Super cool. So the barrow field is one of the draw highlights of this game. And I have run the barrow field many times on my own. Um, I'm going to say on my own, but just for my players on its own. Um, I'll be over with my with, with a group of players, and we don't have a full campaign going, and we'll be like, hey, let's just play some D&D, &D, or let's just play some, some TTRPG, you know, let's play something. And uh, I'll grab this book, and they'll make level zero characters, or they'll make level one characters, and I'll just put them into the field and be like, all right, you guys have traveled here from Helix. What do you do? And I'll give them the map, and they'll be like, oh, let's try Tomb 60. And they go there and like three of them die and they're like, whoa, but then one of them gets like a plus three magical sword and they're like super strong and like, yeah, awesome. And then that person dies in the next tomb to a, to a lightning trap. And it's like, oh no. Uh, it's just a quick way to like have a, a bunch of laughs and, uh, and you know, spend some time playing D&D &D without, without it being too, too serious or, or in, in depth. But obviously you could play this as a campaign too. And, and I, I think the idea of running Barrow Maze as, as like a, the site of a West Marches would be a really good idea, right? So you have like, you know, 10 players, 15 players, 20 players, however many you have uh, in West Marches. And you just have this region. And there's maybe, maybe the, the, the dungeon is the main thing people are going to. And they're going to explore this Barrow and that Barrow. And they're going to find the entrance and they're going to be like, oh, hey guys, we found the entrance to the actual Barrow Maze now. Oh, awesome. And so then we'll go down and we explored this tunnel, but not that hall. And then, you know, you have to map it out. That would be really cool. And I could see running any of these, but especially this one as that kind of mega dungeon. I think Duero Deep and Hyfell would make it a bit harder. And I think maybe Archaea would be a bit harder. This one is, is site-based and a singular site in a way that the others aren't. Uh, and I'll explain more when I get to those. But, but, um, but I think this one would be great for that sort of campaign. Um, for a West Marches, or even just an open table, or, or if you just had like one group of players who just like that style of game. It would be a great campaign to run in that way. 
Um, so now when it comes to the actual descriptions, you'll notice back at the, each of the barrows, you had the map and then the description of the barrow following it, um, sometimes preceding it. That's great. Um, but the actual paragraphs of text are not my favorite. So he, he does bold uh, the, the chamber names and he gives you sometimes bolding in the, in the uh, description and italicized text if it's important and, and sometimes in numbers, like if there's a, number, a certain number of creatures. But it's really often a paragraph of text. And it, like you have to read it before you're, you can't just scan it. You have to read it. And not, so sometimes important information is not just right at the top. So it's not to say that it's bad writing. It's good writing. It's, it's, it's straightforward. But it's, it's just a lot of text to read. Um, and I think, especially more recently, games like, I would say, In the Shadow of Tower Silver Axe or any of those games by Jacob Fleming do a better job of organizing the information and presenting it to the DM so that you don't have to read through paragraphs of text to understand what's going on. Um, now, it's not that egregious here. It's not like some of the 5e adventures that I've read where you're talking about, you know, like a page and a half for like three rooms. Um, and, and really all you need is like two sentences out of those pages to run the room. Um, but it is, it can be, it can be a little uh, taxing to read through this book. And that's true for all of these books, some more so than others. Um, but when you get to the actual mega dungeon itself, um, this is something that I think Questing Beast, Van Milton did a review on this book, and he said this too, and I think this is absolutely right. Um, there aren't maps on the page anywhere in the rest of this book. So you're going through the, this book, and you have, you have to have the map out. And now there is a map at the end of the book, so you can keep flipping to that. If you're, use, if you're playing online, then you have the PDF. Hopefully you can you know, separate out the map and have it as a separate file. But if you're playing at the table, and you haven't printed out the map, then you're going to be doing this the whole time. And that is really annoying at the table. Like, okay, hold on, wait, where am I? Where am I? So you have to print it out. You really do. You have to find it and print it out. Um, and you can buy it online. You can find it online and print it out there. But it's just going to be a, you know, a very big map, or you're going to have to print it out in smaller sections and sheets. This book does have it broken down into sheets, and so you could print them off separately. You could scan them and print them off separately, or just get the PDF and print them off that way. Um, but you know, you do have to do that. The, the maps aren't there, and so you, it's easier to get lost, not just for your players, but for you as the DM. Now, one of the things I really like about this is that this has an illustration book. So it'll say here, show this one, for example. It says, show the players illustration eight in the back of the book when they approach this place. And so then you show them the picture, and they see exactly what it looks like. That's really effective, and my players have always loved it. When I play at a table, and I pull it out, and I show them the illustration, they're like, whoa, every time. Um, so it's very effective. It's a great... Dungeon, it's it's pretty, once you've experienced maybe, I don't know, like 20 or 30 rooms of the dungeon, this is like 300 and some rooms, the whole dungeon. It's a mega dungeon. But once you've done 20 or 30, you, you get the idea. It's going to be fighting undead. It's going to be running through traps. It's going to be searching for secret doors. It's going to be finding and searching through barrel alcoves. It's going to be getting special magic items and special treasure and then trying to get away out of the dungeon before the random encounter that you're inevitably rolling towards finds you and attacks you and, and makes your life uh, much harder than it otherwise has to be. Um, so if you like that loop, you're going to love this whole dungeon and you're going to play through the whole thing. If you don't like that loop, then you shouldn't get this dungeon <laughs> um, because that's what the dungeon is. And this is another reason why 5e I don't think works so well for this because 5e isn't really built that way. It's not built to have this kind of dungeon crawl mentality. Um, so I, I just wouldn't do it. Now, the death traps is another reason. There are just instant death traps in this book. And that's totally fine in a system where your characters are, you know, pretty weak anyway. You as a player might not be that attached to them. You're kind of interested more in, in seeing the dungeon and in seeing how much treasure you can get. And, and you're not so interested in this particular character's story. Um, that's a great piece of art. I don't know if you can see the eyes there in the darkness. Um, so OSR games. Great. Maze Rats, Level Zero characters, Shadow Dark characters. Um, but 5e, no. 5e characters are attached, 5e players are attached to their characters. And the idea that they could die in a heartbeat is really, it just goes against the culture of 5e. Um, die in an instant death trap. 
even if you have explained to your players, hey, this is a dangerous dungeon, you need to be careful, you can't just go you know, plowing ahead. Yeah, okay, they'll do that, but then the first time they fail a saving throw on a trap chest and die to a poison dart, um, doesn't matter how, how much you've sort of explained to 5e players it's a dangerous dungeon, they're going to be mad. And maybe that'll fade after a while. That's fine. But I would say it's just not a good culture fit. Sure, well, maybe I'll say this. There will be culture shock if you try to run this for 5e players. If you try to run it as is for 5e players, even in this 5th edition um, version, it's just not suited for it. Again, I think the reason he did this was because he did, and I think you can tell this, the design philosophy, the design of the game is old school. Uh, all the dungeon, all the encounters were balanced for that, the magic items were balanced for that. I wouldn't even say balance. In old school, balance isn't, isn't primary, it's not important. If, if you are way stronger than the encounter, great, you've got a lucky encounter. If the encounter is way stronger than you are, well, that's most of them. You've got to get out of there, you've got to be smart about how you approach it. Exploration and survival are more important than combat and balance. 5e is, is not that way. So, um, my, my speculation is that this game was built and designed and finished and done for old school games. And then, someone went through and adapted it as best they could to 5e. So it's not designed for 5e, it's adapted to 5e. And what that means is it's not ever going to fit as well. Now, that doesn't mean you can't have fun playing this in 5e. Or that, you know, you might have a group of players who are are not that attached to 5e characters and they, they, they like having to roll new ones up. And, but, you know, you just got to be aware that that's the way. And a lot of the exploration elements will be nullified. Darkness, not important with, with a light cantrip. Uh, again, food, not important with a good berry cantrip. Carrying capacity, not important with a lot of different things. Bags of holding, tensors floating disc. Classes that can make their own bags of holding, like the Artificer. Um, it's a great piece of art of one of the major bosses, villains in this dungeon, which is the Draco Lich. Um, rest, not going to be important once you get those invulnerable spheres and magnums and mansions and things. Um, just there's a lot of exploration elements are trivialized in. Exploration is one of the big parts of an old school mega dungeon, so you're going to going to want to be aware of that. Um, and the combat isn't. Uh, there aren't combat set pieces like, like so. Here's okay. So you, you guys remember my review? Of those of you who watched it remember my review of MCDM's Flea Mortals. That's the way to make monsters in 5e and encounters in 5e interesting, right? Is to give them cool actions and reactions and movement effects and to make the battle cinematic and to make the battle more engaging for you as the DM and for more more engaging for the players that they have to be uh, a bit more you know flexible and use different abilities and 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 it's still combat focused but it it, it Builds, it takes what 5e has and it makes it more um, engaging. Um, and that's the way to do 5e right, is to do combats where you have a lot of minions and you have controllers and you have a brute and you mix and match and you plan for the encounter. That, if, you, if you do 5e that way, it's really fun. It really, really is. This isn't going to do that. The creatures that you're going to get in here, the encounters you're going to get in here are much more standard. Hey, there are six kobolds in a room. Roll initiative. Um, it's a featureless room aside from the barrel alcoves in the corner. And, you know, not kobolds exactly, but you get the idea. There are six ghouls in the room, and there are six barrel alcoves. Roll initiative. In old school, that's fun because you combat's going to last a round or two, and you're either going to turn the undead or you're going to kill them quickly, or you're all going to die or retreat. You have to make a decision quickly. It's not like, hey, we can just sit here and slog out for 30 minutes back and forth and back and forth. The combat's quick, so having a simple you know, uh-oh, quick, easy, what do we do encounter where the environment isn't, you know, incredibly important to the encounter, that's fine. But in 5e, where your battles last an hour, then those sorts of fights get boring really quick. So uh, I would say if you run this as 5e again, it's just not going to be, not going to be terribly engaging. There's a big monster manual at the back here. Um, and then there are rival adventuring parties. There are magic items. There's the art book that comes with this as well, so you can show players particular rooms, particular pieces of art, and it's quite substantial. I'm skipping several pages here. Here are some of the maps of the dungeon itself. As you can tell, it's a mega dungeon. I've dog-eared that page um, so I can run it more easily. It's a mega dungeon. It's got 300 and some rooms. Um, 
not the big 300, almost 400 rooms. It's not the biggest dungeon that you're ever going to see in Mega Dungeon terms, but it's a big one and it is, it's, it's cool. It's got enough distinct zones to make the different encounters, you know, relatively uh, different. The zones are, are similar. But there are some that are very unique and some interesting little things there. And you get the open gaming license, the last couple pieces of art on the last page, and the book. All right, so that was Barrow Maze uh, by Greg Gillespie. Excellent in, in its create construction, excellent in its presentation, uh, in its design. But for 5e, uh, it just it isn't, it isn't right. It doesn't fit. I don't know if any Mega Dungeon survival exploration game works for 5e. Certainly not with the old school mentality. So I would recommend getting this book, but don't get it in 5e. Get it in the old school version. Now, I'm going to relatively quickly cut through The Forbidden Caverns of Archaea because it's, it's very similar. It's got a lot of the same systems. It's got a same hex crawl in the beginning. First of all, the art is awesome. Old school and uh, classic. The book is quite thick. This one is slightly bigger than Barrow Maze. This one is nearly 300. It's over 300 uh, pages. Yeah, 300, just over 300 pages. So it's, it's a bit bigger. Um, art is similarly awesome. This one also I got for 5e. I got all of the books by Greg Gillespie on five, for 5e in print form. And again, I regret it. I wish I had one side. Once I thought about it more, and once I looked through and read through it and actually played it at the table, I realized 5e is just not a good fit for this. Um, 5e does a lot of things well, but dungeon crawling exploration, survival games, it does not. So there's similarly a region, a gazetteer, you have, no, it's set in the same world as Barrow Maze, and so a lot of the information, not a lot of the information, but it's uh, referenced, there are similar references to the, the gods and the pantheons and the overall structure and, and le locations that are external and, and elsewhere. Um, you have uh, some more encounters that are a bit more, uh, a few locations, I should say, that are a little bit more detailed than they are in Barrow Maze. Um, you have the town here, um, Eastdale, which is the sort of, again, where you're going to be uh, with locations and NPCs, similarly given art. And then um, this one has a, a, an evil guy in town, so there's a bit more of like a, there's probably going to be stuff happening there. The setting here is that you're sort of on the frontier of this wasteland, this, you know, kind of, again, Grand Canyon-ish area where there's the broken lands and it's hot and... Uh, and, and then there's this big canyon where this ancient ruined city that was destroyed by magic used to be. And hanging out there is a big horde uh, of various different kinds of monsters who are all unified under this sort of the, the rotten hand, um, this sort of uh, loose alliance underneath the Archons, who are the guys in charge, the bad guys. And they're kind of ruling everybody under them. But there are factions and loyalties amongst these various tribes. Some of them like each other, some of them hate each other, some of them work together, some of them will fight if they see each other. And and that's part of this game is that you're you're trying to figure out the various relationships between the tribes. You can maybe turn them against each other or, or use that to your advantage somehow. But it takes a little bit of work put to put it together. But it is it's worth it. I think if you do it it's worth it because you start to have these really interesting dynamics. So faction play is much stronger in this one than it was in Barrow Maze. Barrow Maze is location, 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 whereas this one is a bit more factiony and a lot a bit more um, stuff going on. So your approach to the the uh, all this stuff details, the different patrols that you can run into, the different random encounters you can run into. Um, and then how to explore the actual caverns. So this is a really cool map of the caverns. It gives you a sense of what you're looking at, which is a canyon with a lot of cave entrances and ruins where this old city used to be. And so there's a lot more variety in the sorts of encounters that you're going to run into. You're, you're going through a city. So there are sewers and there are old ruins and there are caves. Um, both this one and the other one have these features. Uh, this one is they're called the Discs of Carcoon and the other one they're called the... the Tablets of Chaos, I think. And essentially, they're just like little decks of many things. And they are, you, you can look at them, you can read them, and you roll on a table. And something really good or really bad can happen to you, uh, up to and including just death. Well, that happened to one of my players. He rolled a one on the table, and so he, uh, he got the save or die result, and then he rolled another one, back-to-back -back ones, and he just died. One of his characters, I should say, his character just died. <laughs> um, but there's more variety in the kinds of dungeons you're looking at. 
because you're going through a ruined city and some of it again is natural caves and there's this big horde and lots of different creatures have made their homes in the different caves. It's, it's reminiscent of the Caves of Chaos. It's, it's an homage to the Caves of Chaos um, or the Deep on the Borderlands. And, um, and so you get a lot of variety. This also is plug and play because you could take any of these dungeons, any of these factions and just stick them into a different game. And then you would have all of that, um, all of that material just pre-made for you. Uh, stick it right in. So this one too is is plug and play. It also has uh, a, a, a sort of a, an increase in its design in that because the dungeons are smaller, or a, an upgrade to its design, I should say, because the dungeons are smaller, the um, the maps are closer by, so you don't have to flip as much. Very often it's on the same page or just a couple pages earlier, and so you have it right there. Um, sometimes for the bigger dungeons, it's a few pages. But then you'll get a new floor and you'll have this new entry. Now the actual entries are pretty similar. Um, you get bolding sometimes, uh, but often it's just sort of long lists of texts and the paragraphs you kind of have to read through. But it's it's never horrible. It's never too much. Um, you've got cool ideas, uh, you know, bat riders, giant bat riders. You've got a remoraz or a giant lizard there. Um, you've got manticores. And lots and lots of kinds of creatures. Now, again, old school in its mentality, old school in its tone, certainly in the art that you see. Um, this one, I think, would be... I have. This is the one I haven't run. I haven't run any of this. I've run the others. Um, I've run the player that died with the... It wasn't the disc, it was the tablet from the Barrow Maze. Um, I've run Barrow Maze, I've run Highfell. Uh, I have not run... The Forbidden Caverns of Archaea. But it is still... Um, I've used material from it elsewhere. I, I think there's not much more to be said about this one. It's different in tone. It's it's going to be... I would say it's, it's almost a little harder, I would imagine, to run as a campaign. Because... Uh, straight up. Because this... How, why isn't this horde attacking... Um, how is it going to react to you interfering with its tribal members? Um, how are you going to get the factions to go against each other? All that's not impossible to solve, but it would take more work than Barrow Maze, which is like, here's a location, here are creatures down there, go have a good time. Uh, Barrow Maze is a lot easier to run. This one takes more work, but that might make it more rewarding when you actually run it. Um, but certainly the ideas, the dungeons, you can take out of this book and use. You can keep it as a source of inspiration. Just once again, I would say don't use 5e. The combats in here are going to get very repetitive if you use 5e dungeons. If you just use 5e. The sorts of style of combat, the sorts of environments those combats are going to be in, it's just going to get repetitive and boring. You've got to make 5e combats interesting if they're going to last for two hours. An hour and a half each fight. You just, you have to. You owe it to your players to make it an interesting fight. And to make all of these rooms interesting fights, with all of these random encounters that could happen, is a lot of work. So I would recommend not doing 5e. I would recommend doing um, the old school version. So at the very end of this valley, once again, it's, it's similar to the other one in that you're trying to go further and further east. But the end of the valley there is the, uh, the Hellfire Furnace, which is where a bunch of these fire giants are and bad guys are. Um, then you get the uh, you get sort of a way of tracking things like patrols and torches and firelight and rest and all that stuff. And again, only important if you're not if you're if you matter if exploration matters. Um, none of that stuff matters in Five E. And random encounters are another hard thing to do in Five E because of the time requirement, right? It's Five E. Random encounters can take a long time in Five Fifth Edition. Because it's suddenly a fight, and that means you can throw off what a session what the players are trying to do if they have a random encounter on the way. If you're going to make it a, an, the fight's going to take a while regardless because it's fifth edition. If you're going to if you're going to make it challenging, it has to be really challenging, which means they have to use a lot of resources, or it's pointless and they'll just bl blow through it. Um, in which case, it's just a waste of time. But if it's meaningful and it drains their resources, well, then they have to turn back. Say you have a random encounter on the way to the dungeon, you have to turn back before you get there. Um, Unless they have, you know, Morgan Kindness, Magnificent Mansion, in which case they don't need to turn back ever. They need to stay in the dungeon. 
Um, so don't use 5e. <laughs> That's the long and short of it. Don't use 5e for this. Don't get the 5e book. Get the get the old school book. If you really want, get the 5e books in PDF or something like that. If you just want the monster manuals in the back or something like that. Um, but this uh, has a lot of cool magic items. It has these keystone staffs, which you kind of put together. Uh, staves, staves, which you put together and build into these cool um, artifacts for yourself. They do cool things, and you can mix and match heads and things. Uh, and then there's a uh, new spells, new monsters, and quite a few new monsters. There's quite a few new monsters. Um, pages and pages of new monsters. So that's cool in and of itself. Particular monsters, particular archons, the big bads. Uh, and then you got NPC lists, um, and the rival adventuring parties like the other book has. And then you have the art book at the back. And then a little map of the Hellfire, Hellfire Furnace, and also a map of the, ca of the canyon. So you can see definitely influenced by Caves of Chaos, uh, by Keeping the Borderlands. You've got these um, little tunnel entrances at different elevations. You've got them scattered about. One thing that makes it a little harder is that... Um, they're, they're really scattered about. You know, Caves of Chaos was this sort of linear thing and you could see them all. This is like you're kind of navigating through and there's side bits here and then there, it's, it's kind of more of a web. Makes it a little harder to run, but I think it still be cool. All right, well that is the Forbidden Caverns of Archaea. I would recommend both of these books. They're excellent. Um, they have great vibe, great art. Uh, the dungeons within them are cool. And I think the, the, the ideas presented are great if you're going to run them in old school. But they don't work for 5e. They just don't. So, you know, I understand why they were released for 5e. It's a bigger player base. It's going to get more sales. It's going to draw other people in. But it just isn't designed for it. And the design philosophy of old school and 5th edition really clash, especially when it comes to this particular style of game. Exploration, survival, dungeon crawl. 5e doesn't do those things well. Um, so, could you play it in 5e and have a good time? Absolutely. But it's not really designed for that, so I would recommend not doing it for 5e. Unless that's just your system of choice, you really want to try these things out, then you can do it. And, and just warn your players, hey, um, we're going to ban Goodberry, we're going to ban the Light Cantrip, uh, we're going to ban bags of, bags of Holding, we're going to ban the, the spells that let you rest, we're going to ban all that stuff. And be prepared to roll up a new character at a moment's notice because you have de instant death traps. <laughs> then I think you could run it fairly well, uh, as long as you also just are content with a lot of um, middling combat encounters that take a lot of time. Because again, in old school games, combat it doesn't take long; it goes quick, and so you can have those kind of more meaning, uh, more vanilla encounters of okay, here's six ghouls again. Uh, that's not to say you shouldn't try to spice it up and make it interesting. Obviously, you should. But you're going to have those random encounters, and it's going to be another fight, and it's going to be another quick decision, and we're going to have this you know, battle one way or the other. 5e doesn't work that way. All right. Uh, in another video, at some point, I will review Greg's two other books, which are Hyfell and Duero Deep. I have them both as well. Again, both in 5e. But I have the PDFs, uh, and so I will... I'll compare them and talk about how those how those compare to these two. Uh, I think spoiler. I think these are the best two. The other two aren't as good in my in my opinion, but they're 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 both they're both still good. And I think especially Highfell it has a lot of cool imaginative ideas. But I'll come back to those in another video. Anyway, I hope you guys have enjoyed this one, and I hope you have a great day. See ya.